This episode of Food Psych is brought to you by the Body Trust Provider Training Program. The world doesn't need more weight loss coaches or therapists recommending diets or fat phobia and eating disorder treatment settings. The world needs folks like the listeners of this podcast who know how necessary it is for helping professionals to begin working from a weight inclusive paradigm. The Body Trust Provider Training Program, offered by past Food Psych guests Hillary Canavy and Dana Sturdivant of Be Nourished, is a rare opportunity to receive the training and support needed to bring a compassionate healing paradigm into the world. For more info and to apply to the program, go to benourished.org. That's B-E-N-O-U-R-I-S-H-E-D dot org. Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, health at every size, body liberation, and taking down diet culture. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm an anti-diet registered dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor, offering online courses and programs to help people all over the world make peace with food. Join me here every week as I talk with interesting people from all walks of life about their relationships with food and their bodies. And Hey there, welcome to episode 186 of Food Psych. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today I'm talking with fellow non-diet dietitian, certified intuitive eating counselor, and author Jenna Hollenstein for her second appearance on the pod. We discuss her new book, Eat to Love, A Mindful Guide to Transforming Your Relationship with Food, Body, and Life. We also talk about the role of self-compassion and non-judgment in recovery, the importance of having enough, and so much more. It's a really great episode. I can't wait to share it with you in just a moment. I do just want to give a quick trigger warning for the book in case you might be triggered by seeing weight numbers or descriptions of dieting behaviors, but it's a great book and I definitely recommend reading it if you're in the place to deal with those things. And of course, there's no triggering stuff in this conversation and it's a really, really great one. So I can't wait to share it with you in a few minutes. But first, I'll answer this week's listener question, which is from a listener with initials MB, who writes, Hi, Christy. I recently received a diagnosis of Hashimoto's disease after a blood test detected a mildly elevated level of thyroid antibodies in my blood. I've never had any symptoms of Hashimoto's, so it was surprising to me. I was told by an acupuncturist that I needed to go gluten-free and dairy-free in order to prevent the condition from worsening. Otherwise, they said, I could end up with symptoms of hypothyroidism, including weight gain and hair loss. I have a history of restrictive eating and over exercise, and this advice from the acupuncturist has definitely triggered a lot of old patterns of restriction and food fear that I'd been trying to shake. I know that ignoring diet advice is one option, but I'm terrified of the hypothyroid symptoms, and everything I read seems to confirm that gluten and dairy are to be strictly avoided with Hashimoto's. I really don't want to exacerbate the condition unnecessarily by ignoring the advice of the acupuncturist and what seems like the entire internet. How do I navigate the advice to restrict food when it's really important to me that my thyroid stay in balance? Thank you. So thanks, MB, for that great question. And before I answer, just my standard disclaimer that these answers and this podcast in general are for informational and educational purposes only and aren't a substitute for individual medical or mental health advice. So yeah, I totally feel you on this, having Hashimoto's myself, and I'm sending lots of compassion your way. I know it's a really challenging diagnosis when you first get it. First things first, though, I am curious about the diagnosis. I'm curious about who told you that you have the mildly elevated level of thyroid antibodies, but seemingly not actual hypothyroidism, because that's a little odd. So Hashimoto's is definitely a real diagnosis, and it makes people's thyroid levels genuinely too low because it causes the thyroid to attack itself. And that's what's evidenced by those antibodies in the blood. But the idea of mildly elevated thyroid antibodies is very nebulous, and it doesn't seem like you're actually having any evidence that the thyroid is attacking itself with your thyroid levels being too low. It's just that the antibodies are slightly elevated, but your everything else is normal. So I'd be curious to know more about what they actually found and who was the doctor making this diagnosis. And you can definitely get a second opinion, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. But more importantly, I want you and everyone listening to know that restrictive eating and overexercise can actually cause your thyroid to shut down. So the treatment may well involve medication, but it also involves healing from your disorder eating and exercise behaviors. And like you said in your question, that healing is being put in jeopardy by these restrictive eating practices and recommendations. And so let's address those specifically, those recommendations from the acupuncturist. 
First of all, I would take anything that an acupuncturist says about nutrition with a huge grain of salt because the vast majority of acupuncturists are not actually trained in evidence-based nutrition. And that's not across the board, right? There's probably some acupuncturists listening who are and who are very pro-health at every size. And in fact, I've had a few people write in and say that they're health at every size, alternative medicine practitioners of various kinds. And that's awesome. It's great that we have those folks out there. But the alternative medicine world in general is very susceptible to the wellness diet, which is that sneaky new manifestation of diet culture that I'm always talking about that pretends to be all about health and wellness, but is actually still a diet just by another name or going under another guise. And so again, that's not to say that all alternative medicine practitioners are like this, but a lot of people in that world tend to get very caught up in the wellness diet and ignore the evidence showing that disordered eating in and of itself is actually a cause of hormonal imbalances. And Western medicine also has plenty of practitioners that fall into that trap too, by the way. It's just important to keep that in mind whenever you go to see any practitioner, any Western medicine or alternative or integrative medicine practitioner. But especially I think in the alternative and integrative medicine world, there's a lot of that wellness diet stuff floating around. And that is especially true when it comes to hormonal conditions like thyroid or hypothalamic amenorrhea, period problems like we talked about a couple episodes ago. And so it's really important to just recognize that the wellness diet has its claws in the hormonal balance world at this point. And that's why you're seeing so much stuff on the internet being like, cut out these foods for thyroid or whatever. So I would really recommend getting a second opinion from an endocrinologist, which is a type of Western medical doctor or MD who specializes in hormonal conditions and make sure that they're well-versed in disordered eating and preferably also in health at every size. That is definitely hard to find. I think it's easier to find an endocrinologist who gets disordered eating to some extent than it is to find one who's really up on health at every size because that's like the cool people, as I'm always saying, you know, you all listening are the cool people who get it with health at every size, but not everyone does. It's still a sort of small camp at this point in terms of the healthcare field. But you can look up and see if there are any endocrinologists in your area who are specialized in health at every size, who've taken the health at every size pledge. And you can do that at hayescommunity.org. That's H-A-E-S community.org. And then the other really important piece of this is you'll want to work to heal your relationship with food and stop the restrictive eating behaviors because good news, there is no good evidence that cutting out gluten or dairy is necessary for thyroid health. So I've been watching all the scientific research on this for years because not only do I have a personal interest in this as someone who has Hashimoto's, but I also have countless clients and online course participants and listeners who worry about this stuff because of what they hear in diet culture. So good news is that there has never been any sound scientific evidence to indicate that cutting out gluten or dairy is beneficial for the general population of people with thyroid conditions, including Hashimoto's. The recommendations to cut out foods are part of the wellness diet, which again is diet culture's new disguise for the 21st century. And the way that these recommendations seem to have gotten so popular is because supposed health gurus who are really popular on social media and the internet but have zero medical credentials or training or zero scientific evidence behind them are just making things up out of thin air. So it's people like the medical medium who claims to like channel spirits to diagnose people's conditions and is in no way, shape or form a medical practitioner or doctor or even alternative medicine practitioner, like nothing. Gwyneth Paltrow and her whole team at Goop, also no scientific evidence behind them. And Gwyneth Paltrow, right, is an actress. That's her claim to fame. And there's all these Instagram influencers that are doing the same thing without any good evidence or documentation or training behind them. It's just what they think works for them and they're spouting off about it online. And so that's why the whole internet seems to be saying this. And I think if you Google stuff like Hashimoto's diet, that's probably what comes up because that's what's popular and that's what gets picked up, right? But these recommendations to cut out gluten and dairy do not have any good scientific evidence behind them. They may have been spread maybe at first by people who are extrapolating from research that does exist on celiac disease, but that research is not applicable to the general population. So to date, there is no good scientific evidence that being on a specific diet is necessary or helpful for Hashimoto's or really any autoimmune conditions 
other than celiac disease. And celiac disease affects up to 1% of the general population, so it's very rare. And it's a formal diagnosis that needs to be diagnosed by a licensed medical practitioner through standard blood tests and oftentimes an intestinal biopsy. It's not something you can self-diagnose or diagnose through so-called gluten intolerance tests that you find online and stuff or through some alternative medicine practitioners. A couple weeks ago on the podcast, I talked with Catherine Zavodny about some of these quacky practices that are unfortunately still going on in the alternative medicine world, like applied kinesiology and all of these other things. So check out that episode if you want to hear more about that and sort of hear our unpacking of the issues with those tests. But basically, celiac disease is a real well-defined clinical condition, unlike so-called gluten intolerance, which is very controversial, poorly defined, and doesn't have an actual standard diagnostic test or procedure to diagnose it. So there is research, though, on people who have both celiac disease, which, again, rare disease, and Hashimoto's, and these are both autoimmune diseases, showing that for those people, being on a gluten-free diet helps reduce their Hashimoto's symptoms. But again, this is in people who already have celiac disease, and it makes total sense that they would see improvement in their other health conditions from being gluten-free, because in people with celiac disease, gluten causes general problems for their system, since they were born with a gene that makes their bodies essentially attack themselves in the presence of gluten. That's for celiac disease only, right? That's, again, a rare condition and it's clinically well-defined. So if you get tested for celiac disease by a good medical doctor using today's validated testing methods, including the genetic test, and the doctor says you don't have celiac disease, then trust that you don't have it. But some of the diet gurus that I've seen making claims about avoiding gluten for managing thyroid conditions and other autoimmune conditions are basing it on this data from people who have celiac disease. And that's just isn't applicable to the general population as any good public health professional or scientific researcher or anyone with any sort of science background can tell you. So now with regard to dairy, there's also no research indicating that cutting it out has any benefit for thyroid conditions. And in fact, dairy products are an important source of iodine, which is a mineral that's essential for good thyroid function. So if anything, cutting out dairy could actually make your thyroid problems worse. And in fact, that seems to have happened in some case reports of people who are cutting out gluten and dairy, which I'll link to in the show notes for this episode. These people were also not eating regular commercially produced wheat bread, which is another significant source of iodine. And so the takeaway from that is some of these dietary restrictions that people recommend for things like Hashimoto's thyroiditis can actually have unintended physical consequences that are exactly the opposite of what they purport to do. Cutting out gluten and dairy is supposed to help your Hashimoto's, but it actually can make them worse. There's actually clinical evidence that it has for people. I would just take it all with a big grain of salt. All of these messages about restricting certain foods that are floating around and especially demonizing gluten and dairy are very much a part of the wellness diet and its whole MO of demonizing certain foods while elevating others. And in this day and age, the demonized foods du jour really are gluten and dairy and other grains usually. So I personally will share that I manage my Hashimoto's by taking Synthroid or actually the generic version of it, which is called Levothyroxine. It's a lot cheaper than the brand name and it works just as well. And I get my thyroid levels checked as often as my doctor recommends, usually every three to six months. I go to regular doctor's appointments. I get periodic sonograms to make sure my thyroid gland is still okay. And all of this is done with an endocrinologist. Again, that's a type of medical doctor who specializes in hormone health. And I've had Hashimoto's now for about 16 years, and I don't do anything food-wise to manage it because, again, there is no scientific evidence that you need to do anything food-wise to manage it. But when I was still in my eating disorder in the early days of recovery, I did keep thinking that cutting out food groups was going to help me. And I kept trying cutting out gluten and dairy, but it never helped. And that was before this big trend towards cutting out gluten and dairy was happening. It was like at the beginning of the trend in like 2003, 2004, and it never made a lick of difference. And now that trend has just taken over and gotten so many people roped into needlessly cutting out gluten and dairy in the the hopes that it's going to help their thyroid health. And actually, it's putting their health at greater risk because, again, disordered eating is a huge risk factor for thyroid conditions, for thyroid abnormalities. And there's good evidence showing that people with eating disorders, people with restriction, in particular restrictive type eating disorders, 
are harming their thyroid health. And so, you know, today I know all this, right? Today I know that being obsessed with gluten was just another manifestation of my disordered eating and that every time I tried cutting it out, it set me back in my recovery, which also didn't help the Hashimoto's because restrictive eating, again, can really worsen thyroid symptoms. But today, not only am I fully recovered from disordered eating, but I'm also not having Hashimoto's symptoms anymore. And that has everything to do with taking my medication and also like the privilege of having healthcare to be able to afford that, right? To be able to afford to go to regular doctor visits. That is a huge privilege in and of itself, especially in the United States where it's really expensive to have healthcare. That's a huge piece of it is managing the condition, continuing to get the adequate kind of care that I need and also not being a restrictive eater because now I eat gluten and dairy multiple times a day every day and have been doing that for years and it's not harmed my thyroid health in any way. And in fact, my overall health is so much better than it was when I was obsessing over gluten and dairy and restricting my food in other ways. And that was really the onset and likely the trigger of my Hashimoto's. So to recap, I would really recommend getting a second opinion from an endocrinologist who's versed in eating disorders, who can do blood work and interpret your results for you and confirm if you do indeed have Hashimoto's, if that's the correct diagnosis, and if you need to be on medication for it, or if it could be just something secondary to your restrictive eating and exercise behaviors. Hashimoto's also has a large genetic component, and so it's possible that you're going to end up developing the hypothyroid symptoms eventually, but potentially if you catch it early enough and start taking medication that suppresses your body's natural thyroid function or basically replaces it, then you don't end up attacking your thyroid as much. So the endocrinologist can talk to you about that and make some recommendations on that regard. And if you do have it, remember that there's no scientific evidence to support cutting out gluten or dairy, and doing that is much more likely to exacerbate your disordered eating and worsen your thyroid symptoms than it is to help in any way. And by the way, if there's any like science-minded folks out there who want to check this out for themselves, just do a PubMed search on Hashimoto's and gluten, autoimmune conditions and gluten, and you'll see what I mean, that all the published research really comes from populations that have celiac disease already. There was one small study that found in self-reported people with, I think it was Hashimoto's, who put themselves on a gluten-free diet and didn't have celiac disease. They had some self-reported improvements in symptoms, but that can't really be taken as solid scientific evidence to guide any sort of choices because it was a very small study and it was also based on self-report. And we know that people are living in the world, right? People are influenced by what they hear about gluten in this world that is so anti-gluten these days. And so as I talked about with Alan Levinovitz in episode 94 of the podcast, there's this thing called the nocebo effect where when people believe something's going to make them feel worse, it does. And it's not because of the food itself. It's because of this nocebo effect, which is the opposite of the placebo effect. Placebo effect is you think something's going to make you feel better, so it does, even though the thing is actually inert and not helping you at all. And the nocebo effect is you think something's going to make you feel worse, and it does, even though the thing is not actually harming you. So the nocebo effect is a huge thing in any research on like celiac disease, self-reported gluten sensitivity, anything regarding like digestive health or autoimmune conditions really. And so to have any sound scientific evidence to guide people's food choices, we really need to control for that by putting people in randomized controlled trials where the researcher doesn't know what diet people are randomized onto and the participants don't know what diet they're randomized onto so that the results can truly be free of any confounding variables like people's belief that gluten is going to hurt them or the nocebo effect. And one final thing I want to highlight here is that I get wanting a non-medication option to try to keep your thyroid functioning well, but really the best way to do that is not cutting out foods. It's to heal your disordered eating. It's to stop fearing food and cutting out foods and to get back to nourishing yourself fully and completely so that your body has the energy it needs to keep your thyroid and all your other hormones functioning and in balance. And you also mentioned that you're terrified of the hypothyroid symptoms, including weight gain, which says to me that you have some internalized fat phobia to work through, and I'm sure that's not helping in your quest to both heal your relationship with food and keep your thyroid going strong by reducing the disordered eating symptoms. So in addition to finding a good endocrinologist, I would really recommend working with a treatment team to heal the disordered eating, especially since it just got kicked up again by this bogus advice to cut out gluten and dairy. 
So to find a therapist and dietitian who can help you with your recovery, which again is really essential, your recovery is essential for keeping your thyroid in the best condition it can be, you can go to christyharrison.com slash providers. That's christyharrison.com slash providers for a list of folks that have been on the podcast, actually therapists and dietitians that I recommend who really get it. And one final thing is that if you do have Hashimoto's and eventually do progress to having symptoms, I just want to say it's not your fault. So sure, disordered eating and overexercise can trigger this disease as it did for me and millions of other people too, but you didn't know any better at the time, right? You were doing what diet culture pushes all of us to do, which is to eat in restrictive ways and move our bodies in excessive and punishing ways. And you were just doing what you thought was the right thing, which unfortunately, diet culture was just lying to you about what that was. So please don't blame yourself for this or any other chronic diseases you might have. Diet culture loves to put the blame on us and make health out to be a matter of individual responsibility, but that just is not true. You are not alone in having health conditions that you're managing, and you are not to blame for those conditions. So I hope that helps. And if you want to submit your own question for a chance to have it answered on an upcoming episode, you can go to christyharrison.com slash questions. That's christyharrison.com slash questions. And then if you want to ask me any question you want and have me answer it a lot more quickly, you can join my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. When you sign up, you get a wealth of audio and written content teaching you the principles of intuitive eating. And you also get an exclusive monthly Q&A podcast that I do where you can ask your own questions and listen to hundreds of answers I've already given to other participants so that you can work through all the different sticking points that come up in intuitive eating and really put it into practice in your own life. You'll also get access to our private community exclusively for course participants so that you can have some real-time online guidance from me and my team, as well as hundreds of other great folks who are on this intuitive eating path. A participant named Samantha Brown recently shared this on her public Facebook page in a post about resources to learn more about body positivity. She said, a word on books about intuitive eating. I don't recommend them because intuitive eating has morphed too much into the realm of the wellness diet. I do practice intuitive eating and has changed and healed my life, but I did it through Christy Harrison's Intuitive Eating Fundamentals online course. All of my other recommendations are free with internet access or library membership, but this is the one paid program that I recommend because it is that good. And you get lifetime access to her ever-evolving materials. So I love getting feedback like that about the course, and it really is ever-evolving because I'm getting ready to do an update to the materials in the spring based on the almost three years of experience I've had teaching this course. So now is a great time to join because you'll get all the content that people are already loving, plus free access to the updates as soon as they're released. If you're ready to become an intuitive eater and break free from diet culture once and for all, you can learn more and sign up for the course at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. This episode of Food Psych is brought to you by Blinkist. In this busy world, it can be hard to find the time to sit down and actually read a book, but thankfully there's Blinkist. Blinkist is the only app that condenses thousands of nonfiction books into the best key takeaways and need-to-know information, so you can read or listen to them in just 15 minutes. 8 million people are using Blinkist right now, and it has a massive and growing library from self-help to business and health to history books. I like Blinkist because in less than 15 minutes, I feel like I can get more informed and stay up to date on the topics I care about, but don't always have time to keep up with in paper books. They have tons of great books available, including Becoming by Michelle Obama, Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman, and Good and Mad by Rebecca Traister. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash food psych to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash food psych, F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H, to start your free seven-day trial. Blinkist.com slash food psych. This episode is also brought to you by Nurex. Imagine if you could chat with doctors anytime from your phone, get prescribed online, and get birth control delivered straight to your door every month with automatic refills. Enter Nurex, the game-changing company that's here to make getting birth control easier. Nurex offers end-to-end care without ever having to leave your home. It means paying for fewer doctor visits, skipping pharmacy lines, and no more forgetting to pick up your refill every month. Plus, if you don't have insurance, it's the most affordable option out there. 
And if you do have insurance, it could even be completely free. Just go to their website or their app to answer a few health questions for their certified doctors. They carry over 50 brands of birth control so you can choose your go-to or their medical team can help you find the best option. It's all safe, secure, and HIPAA compliant. Just go to Nurex.com slash food psych for a $20 credit and get birth control at your doorstep in less than a week. That's N-U-R-X.com slash F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H. And now without any further ado, let's go talk to Jenna Hollenstein. So Jenna, welcome back to the show. So excited to have you back again. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So last time we talked was the summer of 2017. We posted your episode, which was episode 116, your first episode with us on August 7th, 2017. So like a year and a half ago, by the time this comes out. So tell us what you've been up to since then. I know you wrote a book and all kinds of other exciting developments in your life. So catch us up. Yeah, I think I was deep in writing the first draft of the book at that time. And then so I wrote the first draft, sent it to my editor, and then we changed everything. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, yes. that was a lovely practice of non-attachment, just kind of, you know, letting go of the preciousness of how I had phrased different things and like really reimagining it. It was just such an interesting process of learning writing that book because it was very much based on a hunch that I had that some of the Buddhist practices and teachings that I had been studying had like really solid relevance in working with food and body. But it really wasn't until I started writing it out that I started to discover just how complementary these things were. It, it, it surprised me. And at the same time, I've been raising my son, who's now three and a half. And, you know, the learning curve is so steep, it's almost vertical. So between, you know, writing the book, raising this child, which is just a new level of vulnerability that I have never experienced before. It's like, it's like a limb has been separated from my body and is like walking around the earth independently of me. And it's funny because since I finished the book, the learning has continued in this very steep way. I feel like if I actually sat down to write it today, it would be a completely different book. Just more and more of the applicability of Buddhist meditation and practices to our everyday lives, so much of which have to do with food and body. And it's interesting that you say your relationship with your son sort of has informed how you think about that stuff and the practice of everyday life with a kid. I'm curious what that looks like, you know, how has raising him, and I know we were talking a little bit off mic before about how difficult three is as an age. <laughs> How's that informed your relationship with the sort of knowledge that you had going in? Yeah, it has really informed the writing of the book and my understanding of the chronology of how our relationship with food and body develops over time. Just watching him self-regulate in terms of, you know, when he was just breastfeeding, like he was completely capable of knowing when he was hungry and when he had had enough. And gradually, as more and more things were introduced, he was very clear on what he liked and what he didn't. This was just such a, an important reminder for me that we are literally born with this potential, with this ability, and that any efforts to mess with it go wildly wrong. You know, you mentioned that, I, that he's now three, three and a half, and I have a new understanding of the word three major because I feel like I get a, I'm getting a glimpse of what I will be living with 10 years from now when you know he, I see, first of all I see myself coming back at me my my gestures my words my intonations everything is just coming back at me with a vengeance as he kind of parrots it back in a terrible way <laughs> <laughs> and there's a force because he is an individual he is a human being with his own ideas and his own personality. And so, you know, my job is to help him become himself. And certainly, I serve a, a guiding role. And I see that in terms of like helping him be a good citizen and also helping him like continue to have a good relationship with food and his body. 
But really, it's about like providing him with a foundation from which he can take the lead. But the strength of his autonomy is what surprised me on the one hand and didn't surprise me at all on the other because how we relate to food early in life is like one of the first ways that we establish our autonomy. It's like the first ways we say to our mothers, like, this is me, you are not me. <laughs> like, I am a separate being and I have desires that are unrelated to you. And I have agency. And my reasoning is not always the same as yours. And so when I see people that I work with responding to the diet mentality and to restriction that is either self-imposed or even perceived from the outside with such vehemence and passion and anger and restlessness, I'm sort of reminded of this dynamic of, of what I'm observing in my child growing up, of his rightly taking his own seat, taking his own place in the world, in how he relates to food, and how he relates to everything around him. Yeah, and rebelling against those strictures, it sounds like, too. Rebelling against any, you know, for, in your son's case, just any, any rules, it sounds like, anything that you want to try to make him do. But in the case of of the chronic dieter, it's rebelling against the rules and restrictions of diet culture and shaking off that sort of mantle that's been thrown over us. Absolutely. And often feeling badly about it. And part of what I try to remind people is that this is an intuitive process. This is something that we've kind of already done because, you know, whether we mean to or not, as parents, as adults, as caregivers, Sometimes we try to assert control over a child's eating, and hopefully they put us in our place. But oftentimes it really distorts the process. And so it's sort of like reliving history in a way when we are rebelling against the limitations placed on us, as if we can't trust our bodies, as if we can't rely on them to guide us toward what we need. Yeah. That's really powerful. And I think that's such an important step in the process. And as I'm always telling people, I, I see that too, that people feel badly about it. You know, they feel bad about, oh my God, I'm out of control. I feel like I'm eating all these foods that were formerly forbidden and now I just can't stop. And it's like, I think just sort of placing that in a context is so helpful. Like saying like, no, this is an important phase that you're going through. This is like a developmental stage, really, you know, that you have to go through this in order to return to your own autonomy and get to the place where you can then eventually say like, yeah, I'm, I'm all set on like whatever that food was that I couldn't get enough of and not from a place of diet culture tells me I should be done, but from the place of like, oh yeah, I literally feel in my body that I'm not wanting any more of that now and I can put it down. I totally agree. And I think that it's sort of like a data collection process. And we just have to collect enough data that we prove to ourselves that we have this capacity. And that if we don't let them, no one is going to intervene. Yeah. And I think that learning to trust that no one's going to intervene, I think, is also a real process, especially for people who've been in diet culture for a long time and have had that voice in their head telling them in various ways, maybe it's like an internalized parent's voice or the voice of peers that taunted them on the playground or whatever, it can go very deep and kicking that voice out and making, starting to say like, no, I'm making my own decisions and that voice isn't going to come back and be in charge again, it takes a lot of building of trust. And I do think we need tools to work with it in an ongoing way. Anytime we are physically or emotionally stressed, we can become vulnerable to habitual pathways, right? Habitual ways of thinking and behaving. And so having some sort of framework to, because we still live in this culture, you know, that's cuckoo, how to continue to relate to the outside perspective as opposed to our internal perspective and what we now have learned to be true, what we are working on nourishing and strengthening intuitive eating approach and in taking a health at every size approach to just the care and feeding of ourselves. I think that's so important. And you're right that this culture is going to be 
giving us an onslaught. Diet culture, we all live in diet culture. It's going to continue bombarding us with its messages and it's going to continue shape-shifting too into new sneaky forms that we have to be ever vigilant about, you know, going forward. We don't know what it's going to look, you know, now it looks like quote unquote wellness. And there's a lot of different manifestations of that, but there's new ones every year. There's new ones every month, you know, and there's new, who knows what's going to come next after quote unquote wellness, right? So we just have to kind of continually be aware that that force is going to be out there and have resources and practices we can rely on to come back to, which I feel like comes back to your book then, you know, because I'm curious to dig into what are the tools and resources and practices that you found to be helpful in your work and that you're sharing in this book. And how did that come about too? I'm, I'm curious to hear the story of, like you said, totally revamped the book in, in, the, in between kind of the last two times we've spoken for the podcast anyway. Yeah. And just a a comment about the wellness diet, which you so rightfully call out as this kind of sneaky shapeshifter, I just see them kind of co-opting whatever is trendy, but they're stealing the images or the, you know, the individual words without really understanding the view. So sometimes it's mindfulness now. Sometimes it's some sort of sanitized BOPO body positivity thing. But we need the tools to be able to discern that fake approach to really valuing yourself and taking care of yourself from hollow, money-making, just the same old, same old. I do think that my practice and study of Buddhist meditation has really helped me to do that in like an ongoing way. And it's funny because I think I shared in the first podcast that, you know, I came to Buddhist meditation in my own recovery about a year or so after I stopped drinking at the age of 33. And then I started to see all these ways in which this philosophy was really useful for those of us using any kind of substance or behavior or ideology to escape our reality. And there was one thing in particular that like started me thinking about how this could be an approach, a framework to transforming the relationship with food and body. There are these teachings, these 59 mind training slogans, or the mind training slogans of Atisha, also known as Lojong slogans, some of which I refer to in the book. And this one that goes three objects, three poisons, three seeds of virtue, is the one that just captured my attention. And I was like, oh my God, this is about food. This is about body, you know, loathing. And the three objects are things that we like, things that we don't like, things that we don't care about. The three poisons are grasping onto the things that we like, pushing away the things that we don't like, and just numbing out to the things that we don't care about. And then the three seeds of virtue are freedom from that grasping, freedom from that aggressive resistance, freedom from ignorantly numbing out. And I just see each of those three things, grasping onto pleasure, pushing away discomfort, numbing out. These are all ways in which we use food and use our particular breed of body image at times. I mean, in terms of food, just being able to see ourselves as we experience like the dissolution of a pleasurable eating experience as our bodies become satisfied, we can sort of start to see ourselves grasping onto pleasure when we want to fight against that dissolution. And we sort of want to chase the satisfaction that we felt at the beginning of the meal, for example. Or we want to kind of hold on aggressively to something we consider positive, you know, a positive experience. Or even like a weight, a weight suppressed weight that we've forced our bodies to be at, some outcome of dieting. Yes, the idea that we can love our bodies only if they stay a certain way. And the sort of denial of how our bodies continue to change. Sometimes get sick, sometimes get injured, sometimes don't work the way we want them to. And oftentimes it's some combination of grasping and aggression and ignorance that we're working with. I can say in my own life, in working with the three poisons, aggression has been a a major theme for me, sort of pushing away what I didn't want to feel. 
And in some ways that took the form of grasping on to the pleasure of eating or shopping or numbing out by drinking. You see how they, they can kind of overlap. But what I think meditation has to say about all of this is that we develop the capacity to even see ourselves having these responses to things. We start to like see ourselves in real time. And that doesn't mean that discomfort is going to be any more comfortable, but that we can tolerate it a little bit more and we can start to kind of turn toward it and even like feel it, maybe learn from it and develop the resilience that comes from being able to stay in that space of discomfort. Well, being able to tolerate discomfort, I think, is such a huge skill for recovery, right, from anything, like from substance use disorders, from eating disorders, from diet culture in general. I think it's the thing to focus on if you live in a human body. (laughs) Yeah. Right? Because we're all going to experience discomfort. That was the first noble truth. That was the first teaching of the Buddha after attaining enlightenment, that suffering is an inevitable part of life. And the fact that we deny that truth is what amplifies our pain and suffering. Yeah, that, that we're, we're grasping on and we're pushing away and we're, we're numbing out to the reality of what is. Yeah. And this has so many implications beyond food and body, but it's so interesting to me, and I'm sure you've seen this in your clients, when, when they start to learn to engage with this stuff and see their habitual patterns when it comes to food and body image stuff, then it starts to like expand to work, relationships, family, other ways that they kind of try to modify their reality. Yeah, it really spills over into every aspect of life. This like development of intuition and development of capacity to sit with discomfort and sort of just notice what's coming up without judgment, which I think is another really important practice or skill developed through meditation is that non-judgmental awareness. I think that does, I mean, I've seen so many clients change careers or start to question a relationship or, and that's not a bad thing, right? Like, it's not like, oh, you start down this intuitive eating path and suddenly your whole life's going to be upended. No, it's more like you start down this intuitive eating path and then you start to recognize where is there stuff going on in your life that is also problematic or that also needs attention or that, you know, that you're just becoming aware more globally of what's going on for you. I think you start to relate to your experience more directly without making it more than it is and without making it less than it is. I think we become more clear and more honest with ourselves. You know, I often think about um, Kristen Neff's work on self-compassion and how she talks about the three sort of components of self-compassion, self-kindness versus self-judgment common humanity versus isolation, and mindfulness versus over-identification. And I think you're touching on that aspect of like the ability to be mindful, to be present to what is happening, to ride your experience through the ups and downs, just to stay with it. Rather than over-identifying, maybe making it better than it is or making it worse than it is, which a lot of us do too, because somehow the sort of negativity bias makes us feel safe in a way. And I think the negativity bias, I mean, especially when it comes to food stuff, I think is very present because diet culture puts so much of that bias on things. So when people are, say, turning to food for comfort, for example, you know, and and that is so complicated because also a lot of people, I would venture even most people probably don't turn to food for comfort without some level of restriction to start. So then the behavior of turning to food for comfort, instead of sort of noticing that non-judgmentally and being like, huh, I wonder where that's coming from, or like, that's happening, like just being present with it. I mean, like that, that's what's going on right now. You know, it's like this jumping to pathologize it or making it negative. You know, that's that negativity bias coming from diet culture is like, oh my God, I'm an emotional eater and I have to do something about it. I have to fix my emotional eating. And then suddenly there's this huge problem that you've created out of something that is just maybe like, well, A, you know, there's a different route to it that you're not necessarily observing when you're jumping in that way to the negative. And also being able to be aware with non-judgment, I think, frees us up to be able to take more thoughtful action as opposed to reflexive action. Yeah. Well, I think it has to do with that kind of underlying view of, intuitive eating of Buddhist philosophy, I think there's a lot of commonality. In our culture, we love problems to be solved. We love doing stuff. You know, you always hear people saying, we're, we're human doings, not human beings. 
I think that both of these approaches encourage us to not vilify or make a problem any part of our experience. Even the most dysfunctional behaviors and thoughts can be related to with openness and without judgment and in a way that sort of acknowledges that, you know what, in a way they were, they sort of made sense. It was a way that I was trying to feel safe when I had limited capacity. Now that I can see myself doing this, I can give myself the compassion and the kindness that I needed all along and the acceptance that actually does allow me to make changes down the line. Yeah, I think that level of self-compassion is really essential for any kind of change when it's, you know, especially with regard to disordered eating and body image distress. The traditional, the way that diet culture teaches us, and I think you're right, that that's, that comes from sort of a larger sense in which Western culture is just about like fixing and doing and solving that way is just like have to do this program and this protocol and cut out these foods and then you'll fix your disordered eating problem or whatever versus the sense of it's okay, I understand, like it kind of makes sense that you would be doing this from whatever perspective you're coming from, whether that's the eating disorder or disordered behaviors with food is giving you some kind of coping skill that you didn't have and that wasn't available to you and you have trauma going on that you need to be, you need some sort of coping skill for. Or like, hey, you know, this all this restriction I've been doing, like maybe that's the root of the problem. Or it sort of opens you up to see the roots of things. And it's a more charitable view, I think, towards yourself too, you know, to be able to say like, hey, this isn't just my fault. This isn't just my being a bad person and I'm so terribly broken and like uniquely broken that nobody else can understand, you know, it's like, the common humanity part of self-compassion where it's like, no, we're, we're all in this together. And we all, you know, a lot of us experience this sort of thing and it has systemic roots and it has, you know, there's reasons for it. It's not just because I'm this terrible, weird individual out here on my own. Well, and I always say, you know, self-aggression will never heal self-aggression. We can't try to remedy a self-aggressive approach to our bodies by being further aggressive, by demonizing some part of us, by trying to exercise some problematic part of us, we can expand to accommodate all parts of ourselves. And that actually is the most generous thing that we can do. And that allows us to move forward without feeling like we need to move away from ourselves. I love that. And yeah, I think you're right that this sort of moving away from ourselves is at the root of so much strife in our culture in general, but I mean, specifically with regard to food and bodies, right? Your best self, your new you, always about getting over there. And that inherently takes us out of the process. That inherently takes us out of the moment because we're focusing on some sort of outcome that we probably can't even imagine. And as a result, we just, our mind and our body are in different places by definition. So it's only in coming back to the present moment body and whatever is going on, body, mind, and heart, that we can take the next right step. It's just a series of next right steps based on what we know in the moment and the context of our, you know, the data we've collected. Right. I mean, I think that's so interesting in terms of intuitive eating when you think about that next right step and the data that we've collected as individuals. There is no one right way to eat. There is no one right prescription for everybody because who am I to say that my next right step is going to be your next right step, is going to be the people listening's next right step? Like, that's just, no one can say that. That's impossible. So, in a way, like, there's this, I mean, you talk about this in the book too, that this is a spiritual process. Like this diet culture is a spiritual problem and intuitive eating is sort of a spiritual practice that is a solution to it or that is a way out of it. It really is so deep when you think about it, you know, that like, what is the next right step for any human being? Like, no one can say that. No one can say what it is for you, but you have to find it out for yourself. And that's what intuitive eating really is, is kicking out the diet culture and all the beliefs that you've internalized that are telling you, no, it's this way. No, it's that way. This is your next right step. Or only You're only allowed to eat these things and just getting rid of all that and like tuning back into yourself. 
and giving yourself the space to decide what that next right step is or find out what that next right step is. That's really the point is to build the trust in order to allow yourself to drive the bus. I do think it's a spiritual problem because when you look, when you dig down beneath layer upon layer of what this is built on, the diet culture, we all want to be loved, included, visible, safe, seen, desired. These are not things that can be treated with a diet or with a certain body type. But we've sort of adopted this belief, and I talk about it in the book as kind of magical eating, that if I just find the right diet, if I just get my body fat down to whatever or my chisel my, I don't know, body part of choice, you know, to this, I will find safety. I won't suffer. I won't be vulnerable to that first noble truth. I'll be able to sidestep the difficulties of having a human body and living on this planet. And even though it's not necessarily sold in so many words, so many of the diets kind of prey on that, prey on our discomfort and our fear of feeling discomfort. Oh, totally. And I love that phrase, magical eating. I think that's so spot on because it really does capture the sort of magical thinking inherent in diet culture's prescriptions. And especially, I think, the wellness diet, like we were talking about, you know, this modern guise of diet culture that pretends to be all about health and wellness, but is actually just this new form of oppression, this new form of diet culture under another guise. And it's so insidious because it makes it seem like well, if you do things this way, you'll be, you know, even sort of like co-opting spiritual language. I see that a lot. You know, you'll be enlightened. You'll be your highest self or whatever. It's so awful. I think magical eating actually allows us to discount the data that we've collected through diet after diet, through lifestyle change after lifestyle change, through wellness diet after wellness diet, because they all lead to the same shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but that sort of magical eating really does allow us to discount that and think, well, maybe the next one. That's such a great point because, yeah, it doesn't, you're not being present and attending to all of the data you've accumulated in your own body, in your own life and saying like, hey, let me question this. Let me take a step back and recognize that what I've been doing isn't working and that the commonality here and all of these things is that I'm trying to follow some outside plan telling me what to do and it never has the promised benefit. I mean, I think even getting to that place in diet culture where you can start to consider, hey, these diets all have been failing me and like sort of interpret your data in that way takes a lot because diet culture is so good at brainwashing us to think, oh, it's your fault if it doesn't work. And so we get all this data, but then we interpret it through the lens of, oh, I guess I'm a failure. Well, I think that starts very early, you know, start to take in the messages of some of the foods that we like to eat are dangerous to eat because they might lead to a bigger body or they might lead to ill health as if most of what determines our health isn't completely out of our control. And so we start to just even mistrust our sense of pleasure in eating certain foods, you know, and our body's experience of deriving pleasure from that. I think that's a really important point that it's this disconnection. I think that's actually such a perfect point to tie together all of what diet culture is, because in how I'm defining and describing it in the book and in my work in general, it's like, you know, it has this point, of course, about weight loss is is prized and smaller bodies are held up as better and larger bodies are stigmatized. But also this additional pillar of diet culture, demonizing certain foods while elevating others. And it is so important. And that is very much like at the fore of the wellness diet these days, because a lot of wellness diet proponents don't specifically say they're about weight loss. They'll sort of obliquely promise weight loss, but it's, you know, very coded language now. It's not in the forefront. And so people are like, no, it's not about weight. It's about health. This is a lifestyle change to get healthy. And like, oh yeah, I may lose weight as a side effect, but that's like not even the point. You know, it's like they're <laughs> they're really downplaying it. But I think you're so right in sort of highlighting this disconnection from our bodies, this disconnection from what's pleasurable and what we want is kind of like the first step almost before we can even 
articulate commentary about body size or know what it means to like want to lose weight we're told well that food's bad and that food's good and so you can't trust yourself right and like connecting it to body size also saying these bad foods will make you larger so don't eat them right and I think that definitely the Buddhist path, and I believe the intuitive eating path, is really about taking an honest look at things and figuring out what is the truth. The word for the teachings are, is the Dharma. And that also means like the truth. And so I always think of the first principle in intuitive eating, which is rejecting the diet mentality. And we start to like strip back all the so-called common sense we've taken for granted unquestioningly, and we finally get to discover what we like, what it feels like to be in our bodies, what it feels like to prize and to respect our own experience, as opposed to the so-called expertise of somebody out there. It is kind of a spiritual process. Yeah, I'm curious how you sort of made that connection and how to dig in a little more in terms of what you mean about that. Yeah, I mean, the more I think about it, the more I'm in this space, the more I see the sort of inextricable nature of the spiritual self and the physical self. And in the Buddhist world, I mean, we're often quite happy to sort of intellectualize the teachings. And yeah, sure, they're about our everyday life, but we kind of leave our bodies out of it as if we could even meditate without our bodies. You know, our bodies are what allow us to interact, to feel, to sense, and to do anything. And then the other piece of it is that I started to realize the collective loss when we never realize our full potential because we're so busy making ourselves into self-improvement projects and feeling inadequate. Like, I feel that I am currently losing, I have lost, I am losing out, and we will continue to lose out on the gifts of other people as long as we are oppressing anyone, as long as we are keeping anybody limited. That is beautiful. That's so well said. But in our little space of food and body, which is not a little space, right? It's really expansive. It really touches on everything. I started to think about like, what would everybody do with that mental real estate if it wasn't occupied by how can I be better, thinner, fitter, cleaner? What would we do? Would we make the world better? Would we attend to some of these kind of gaping wounds in the planet? I really think we would. I mean, I think it's shocking how many people I meet and connect with through the podcast and work with as clients, people that are so just like fascinating and full of interesting ideas and insights and talented and you know, just really cool, awesome people that are so caught up in this food and body stuff that they lose out on that, you know, the ability to bring those gifts to the world. And we all lose out. Yep. And, you know, I was struck by what Michelle Obama was saying when she was on her book tour for Becoming about how she sat at the most powerful tables in the world. And the people sitting around those tables are not that smart. (laughs) The people running the world who have nary a micron of self-consciousness are not that smart. And yet here are these amazingly powerful women, a lot of, you know, a lot of women and men who are in some ways paralyzed by this feeling that they're not good enough because fill in the blank. Yeah, they're, they're stopped from bringing those gifts to the world and running the world in a way that would be a lot more, I think the world would very much benefit and very much be healed by more of the kinds of people that I see in my practice that I'm sure you see in your practice having positions of power. And that involves becoming yourself, not anybody else. And it's interesting how I see from the outside so many of these folks that I interact with and work with and stuff as being so amazing and incredible. And like, I see those gifts just sort of emanating from them. But I think they don't see it themselves. And I know that for myself too, you know, I had therapists that told me the same thing that would be like reflecting back the goodness they saw in me. And I'm like, I just can't see it right now. (laughs) You know, like, I don't get it. I don't get what you're talking about. And I think that's the saddest part 
of all is that it takes us away from recognizing our own goodness, not just not even greatness, you know, not even like our own capacity to really do awesome things and change the world because it takes that away too. But it also just takes away our ability to see ourselves as like, yeah, you're okay. You're cool. Like, I like you. Well, and that this is another piece of the Buddhist philosophy that I feel is so relevant here because there is this concept or this reality more like is of a Buddha nature or in the lineage that I study, it's called basic goodness that we all have. And it's very much the antithesis of the kind of Judeo-Christian idea of original sin in which we are born bad and need to earn goodness. The idea is that because we exist, we are good. You know, we have inherent worthiness that we are born with and that we carry with us. The path is the process of realizing that. Waking up to our own goodness, right? Yeah. They often use those words, waking up. I studied a little bit of Buddhism in my sort of early recovery as well and just learning about meditation. And one story that always really stuck with me is this idea, and I can't remember the exact context, but it was this idea that there was like a beautiful golden statue of the Buddha, I think, that then got buried in like mud and sand in order to protect it. And that it was always still inside. It was always still in there, but for millennia or something or decades or whatever, people just thought it was like this funky old statue that was, you know, made out of mud. And nobody really thought much about it. And in fact, it's got this golden inside, you know, the, and that that's sort of how we all are, how we all look at ourselves. And the process of waking up is about stripping away those layers of mud and dirt and recognizing what we really have within us. And again, recognizing that sometimes they often are about protection. Because for some reason, our, our Western culture does not necessarily celebrate that level of self-confidence. It's a very Eastern philosophy. I remember hearing a story, I think it was the Dalai Lama who had come to speak to a Western audience and someone had asked the question about like dealing with poor self-esteem. And as the story goes, like the Dalai Lama goes back and forth with his translator a little bit asking for clarification. And then he's like, do you feel this way? Do you feel this way? Do you feel this way? <laughs> Everyone in the audience felt this way, and he was sort of dismayed by this because this was not something he was familiar with. You know, we have this sort of inherent sense of inadequacy. And, you know, the idea that Buddhism might pervade the culture and allow people to recognize their inherent goodness is, I think, a powerful powerful one because we kind of need all hands on deck. <laughs> <laughs> and we need more of that, you know? I feel like how cool would it be for the next generation to be like, what low self-esteem? What is that? You know, like I mean, how cool would it be to not understand what that means because so many of us are just imprisoned by it for our entire lives. Well, it's even interesting to think of like the concept of self-esteem. Krista Neff talks about this in her self-compassion research too, because self-esteem may not be the right question, right? Even though most of the psychological research in the last several decades is focused on it, in order to have self-esteem, we need to be above average and we need to be better than the other guy and we need to be constantly achieving. That's not the greatest paradigm. That's only contributing to our low self-esteem. She offers that the idea of self-compassion, on the other hand, allows us to recognize our inherent worthiness and to continue to work with ourselves. Yeah, I think I would definitely much rather have compassion than adulation, you know? I think that's a much more sustainable approach to things. So I get, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, this idea of self-esteem as being like, because, yeah, if we're basing our self-opinion on being better than other people or outside metrics, it goes back to, again, something outside ourselves that we're judging ourselves by and rules that we're following that aren't coming from within. Because I don't think when you really look within that anyone's deepest desire without the conditioning of culture would be, oh, I want to be better than that person. I want to compete. I want to win. Yeah, I know. 
I think it's like, it's just like, I want to be accepted. I want to be loved. I want to be seen. Yeah. I want to be recognized for like what I am and what I have, but not because I stepped on someone else to get here. Well, and it's also mathematically impossible for us all to be above average. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. That's not, that's not a winning game for the majority of us really. And so, you know, sometimes it's like, maybe we're asking the wrong questions. Maybe we need to look at this differently. And that's what I love about your book. I feel like you do ask different questions and plant seeds for people of a different way of looking at things that opens up not just people's relationships with food, but also their relationships with their bodies, their relationships with the people in their lives, their relationships with everything. You know, I think sometimes I, I appreciate those words. Thank you, Christy. <laughs> My heart swells when I hear that. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, all the years of toiling are worth it. But I think some. I I love having a framework. I think my personality type loves to sort of have some sort of scaffolding with which to frame concepts. This is lifelong work. And sometimes we need something to sort of reinvigorate that process. And just having a new framework through that lens to view the relationship with food and body can awaken some freshness and help to see things in a new way. Yeah. And seeing things in a new way, I think, is such a central thing for recovery, but also for cultural change, too. Like, as you said in the book, compassion and attunement is a radical act in diet culture, and it can actually help change and shift the culture because all of these people sort of shifting their frame is inevitably going to shift the culture as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm curious to go into a little bit this idea that you brought up in the book about why fullness is particularly difficult. And I think we sort of touched on it a little bit at the beginning, but I I just want to like delve into that because that's one thing that I see a lot in my clients and I'm sure you do a lot too is like people have a real difficulty feeling fullness, accepting fullness as a state as a physical state and i think in the sort of more spiritual sense too it's interesting this metaphor of like fullness of life you know being fully yourself or coming into the fullness of who you are is also really scary for us yeah i mean i think when we're coming from a history of deprivation or even thinking that we should be depriving ourselves it takes a while to get comfortable with what enough feels like When we're coming from that perspective, in a way, nothing could ever be enough because we're not safe. We're always under threat that food will be scarce, that the next day we won't have access. So really starting to ask ourselves what we enjoy, what gives us a sense of pleasure, satisfaction, and enoughness can help us figure out how to even approach that quality of fullness. I mean, it's interesting to think about, oh, kind of overlaps with the topic of satisfaction because there's like fullness that you can experience, just the physical fullness of like eating a ton of kale, or there's the fullness and, and I would say satisfaction that comes from eating what you want, when you want it, in the amount that feels like enough. Meaning, if you were to eat more, you would actually get less of a reward. Yeah, the pleasure element is there too, right? That that's, you know, the the idea that your pleasure is inherent in what feels like enough. It's enough to give you the pleasure that you were desiring to satisfy your needs. And that's a moving target that our bodies can sense in the moment, depending on what is happening in the moment. You know, how many people want to know, well, how much of this should I eat? What's a normal portion? (laughs) Right. Because again, they feel like they can't trust themselves to not overdo it. And it's interesting in, in Buddhism, there's this idea that like enlightenment enters through the senses. And that just like made my head explode while I was writing the book because I was like, oh my God, it's true. Our sensual selves are capable of perceiving what is happening in any moment and what we need. So as we're eating something, depending on the different causes and conditions surrounding that, we can discern what level of fullness we want to eat to. Yeah. And it's not about a sort of outside imposition either. It's about 
what actually feels good to us. I think getting reconnected with those cues takes a lot of practice. But once you do, I feel like it doesn't require conscious thought. It feels effortless. Right. And and also, I think it takes a lot of time for that morality to be stripped out of the equation. Because the feeling of your genes pressing against your stomach, it's just a sensation. It's just a physical phenomenon of fabric against flesh. It's the judgment that we attach to it that makes it positive or negative or neutral. And so being able to experience the physical sensation pre-judgment, pre-morality, is what gives us the capacity to say, well, did that generally feel good for me? Maybe I would do it different next time without like, you idiot, I can't believe you did that again. Or like, oh no, you're not supposed to be this full because you're like a bad person now because diet culture says so. (laughs) Yeah. And I think too, that idea of enough is so essential. And I talk about that a lot also in my work. You can't even think about fullness from that perspective, like you said, of non-judgment and sort of being able to just connect with your body and say, oh, you know, I'm good. And like naturally let the fork fall or push the plate away because you feel like you've had enough without actually having enough. When you're in a constant state of deprivation, when enough is this elusive thing that you never can get a grasp on, of course, you're always grasping for it. And of course, then that sense of like naturally feeling like you've had enough never comes. Well, and we've very few of us have been asked before what what would feel like enough for us. We've been taught not to refer to ourselves in that way. Right. And we've been taught to fear, quote unquote, too much. So enough feels like it's dangerously close to too much that you have to have just enough. Yeah. It's so interesting, the parallels between like food, too much food or enough food and kind of ourselves being enough and ourselves being too much. I mean, the too much words just like hit a nerve for me because I always felt like too much. And I mean, just to kind of harken back to my son now, like even kind of seeing his intensity, it hits that nerve of like, oh God, is he going to be too much just like me? It just, again, it speaks to that like underlying, like just, we just want to be okay. We just want to be okay. (laughs) But we're awkward and messy and all kinds of crazy and we're totally okay. Yeah, it's all of it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think, yeah, that's that's such a really important, like, duality to hold, too. This, like, idea that, yeah, we sometimes feel like too much or feel like not enough or we're all over the place. And we're okay. And, like, we are just exactly where we need to be. Mm-hmm. There's this great story about this Zen teacher, Suzuki Roshi, that I talk about in the book, where he was like teaching in San Francisco in the 70s and his students are asking him all these questions that clearly came from like the point of view of we need to get this right. And he said, he answered basically, you're perfect just as you are and you could use some improvement. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like both at the same time. Oh, that's and hilarious. And it's that idea of like once you accept yourself as you are, then you actually have the capacity for change. And the change becomes also authentic. It becomes the things that you want to change about yourself are not coming from a place of external imposition. And like, because diet culture tells me I should shrink my body or because culture in general tells me I should be more of this and less of that or whatever. You can throw away those attitudes. And I mean, with in the case of diet culture, anyway, we can't decide we want to shrink ourselves and then do it permanently. That's just not how bodies work. But once once we are able to sort of reject those ideas, I think it becomes easier to just tune into like, okay, what would help me feel better in my skin? What would help me feel better in my life from a place of truly, you know, honoring who you are? I think it becomes very, very related to whatever our core values are, ever they are, whether they include wellness, whether they include some kind of fitness, whether they include sensuality and pleasure whether they include helping other people that is true that is a good point that like your own value system that becomes your guiding set of principles once you're able to suss out what what those actually are as opposed to what you kind of had conditioned into you absolutely it's that process of discovery that intuitive eating encourages 
stripping away all that programming and just asking yourself questions sort of for the first time. I even see, this is sort of off topic, but I even see parallels between this process and like sexuality and sensuality. Questioning like, wait a second, I just sort of took a patriarchal paradigm of sexuality and put lipstick on. What's that about? And I was talking about this with Evelyn Triboli and she's like, oh yeah, we should do something called intuitive sexuality. Yes. (laughs) Oh my God. But like, it's the same sort of questions of stripping away our programming, much of which we comply with just because we want to feel okay and safe and included, but really starting to ask ourselves questions we've never asked before. What feels good to me? What do I like? What feels right? And that's interesting, I think, going back to this idea of feeling like you have enough to start or feeling like you're safe, feeling like you have your basic needs met. Like we have to have those things first before we can even start to say like, okay, what do I actually like? You know, what actually feels good? Because I think like with with sexual trauma, you know, I think a lot of us, I mean, some of the reasons that we sort of fall into these patriarchal ways of relating is that it's safe, right? It, it keeps us safe or has kept us safe maybe in the past or has kept our ancestors safe. And we know this, we like live in a culture where we see people being policed for not doing things the patriarchal way in the bedroom or in regard to eating or food or your body, you know, how you move your body, right? All of it. And so we feel like we have to do it this way. And so, yeah, this sort of sense of like, do I really want to do this? Is this something that feels good to me? Or is there something else that would feel better? I think those questions can't even really be asked until you feel like I can actually step outside of the oppressive system that has conditioned me and still feel safe and still feel okay, like still have the resources to be safe and meet my needs and not get into trouble, basically, you know, especially with with regard to sex, like having a, a partner who's safe to ask those things of, right? The, to, who's open to talking about those things with, or with regard to food, having enough food to eat in general, right? Not have not being food insecure and having the money to afford the things that you do like so that you then can ask yourself the question, what do I like? Yeah, I often kind of refer back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We cannot think about further questions if we don't have our basic human needs met. Yeah, I think it's so helpful, that hierarchy, because it really, you know, I think a lot about the law of attraction, which is so popular right now in wellness spaces, and how problematic that is in so many ways, because I think it doesn't account for this hierarchy of needs, you know, and maybe the law of attraction can work if you're at the top of the hierarchy of needs where you're like all the needs are met and you're sort of getting to the point of like really getting granular on what you want but for everyone else for anyone who's and of course we all sort of cycle through that hierarchy of needs at different points in our lives too so like you can never fully just rely on something like the law of attraction to get you what you want in life because you you know if you don't have enough food thinking that you want you know seven million dollars in your bank account probably isn't going to isn't going to bring it in. You know, you got to like focus on just getting those basic needs met. I saw a great post on Instagram. It it said, maybe you manifested it. Maybe it was your white privilege. Yes. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Oh, so true. (laughs) I know when this comes out, the episode that will have aired probably like three weeks ago or something by this point. But as we're recording this, I think it was, it was recent. We talked about born on third and think they hit a triple phenomenon where in that episode it was with Catherine Zavodny and it was with regard to health and wellness professionals who have always been in a thin body and are talking about the quote unquote obesity epidemic and you know with all of this privilege that they've they're not acknowledging but as if we didn't help create it by creating this culture of fear and restriction exactly as if the solution was just like eat like me and move like me and you'll look like me, which is just ridiculous. Or like my friend Susan says about any like self-help book with somebody on the cover, it's like, I'm just like you, only better. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. (laughs) Oh, it's so insidious, that marketing. I know. (laughs) (laughs) That's why I don't want to be on the cover of any of my books, if I can help it. (laughs) And, you know, that dynamic is what prevented me from practicing in nutrition for the first 15 years of being an RD. 
idea of like, I have the knowledge, I'm going to hand it down to you from the mountain was like, no, Ugh. nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> no. What about that person's culture? What about that person's lived experience? What about that person's, you know, different markers for physical and mental health? I mean, we're not, we didn't take any of that stuff into account when we were telling people to follow a <laughs> gram sodium diet. <laughs> oh, I know. Handing it down from on high, like... Well, the research suggests that risk is lower in people who eat this way. It strips away really the humanity. We didn't know to question ourselves, but I think we have enough evidence to question ourselves now. Yes. Because what we know to be true has changed so many times. To me, that is the best argument for referencing our individual bodies to drive the bus. That's interesting. I wonder if that's part of why intuitive eating is starting to have sort of a resurgence now. I hope. I hope. I really feel like it is. I think, and I don't think it's a trend. I think it's a, it's a necessary response, like you said, to all of this diet culture, to these century and a half now of diet culture. And yeah, I think it's interesting, the responses, because I feel like the low-fat craze of the like 60s through 90s and then the backlash of like low carb from the 90s to now basically has confused a lot of people. I remember being very confused by it too and feeling like I had whiplash. Like, okay, this thing that we thought was good was now bad and this thing we thought was bad was now good. And like, what, like what's happening? And nutrition science seems totally weird if that's the case, you know, like what are nutritionists even doing? <laughs> well, not we're looking for safety and security and certainty. We do not like uncertainty. We're very uncomfortable with it. We want to know what we know. And again and again and again, it's been proven that there is no ground. These things are constantly changing. And part of what's crazy about nutrition science is that there are just so many individual things to control for. It's extremely difficult to figure out what is true. <laughs> exactly. Why not sharpen our ability to detect what's happening on our own bodies? And it's interesting because I think the sort of response, like there's like a fork in the road maybe in terms of how our culture is responding to this idea that like nutrition science doesn't have it all together. Nutrition science isn't all it's cracked up to be. One branch of that fork is the wellness diet, which is sort of like, okay, we'll, we'll tell you how to eat and you're looking for certainty and we'll give it to you, but it's in this way. And it's like, this is so different. You know, it's like the Michael Pollan sort of camp of like, nutritionism is bad. Breaking things down into their component parts, like never got us anywhere. So what you should eat is quote unquote real food. And like, all of the the wellness diet that sprung out of that of like it's plant based it's whole it's whole 30 it's paleo it's like don't eat processed stuff blah 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 which is all just more of the same more of the same rules more of the same effort to like give people certainty in a realm that is by nature very uncertain and with a healthy dose of white supremacy added to it yes oh my god totally white supremacy and like thin people telling everybody how to shrink their bodies but the other branch in that fork is intuitive eating and health at every size. You know, I'm really starting to see that as this is what's happening in the culture in this moment. We're sort of at a crossroads or at a fork. And like, I think this other path is really, I mean, I think it's where it's at. You know, I'm, I'm on it. And I see the Buddhist philosophy as being very complementary to those because it is all about referencing your personal experience and doing what is right for you in view of the fact that that has, you know, ripple effects. But again, like trying these things out in your real life and like figuring out what works. And that is the ground, right? That is like as much as we don't have a real foundation under us or that things are shifting under our feet, it's kind of an illusion to try to look for the ground or the foundation or like the solid, like this is what it is kind of thing. And as much as we can look for a foundation, it's like what our next step is, you know, it's, it's the ground that springs up to meet us as we take that next step. And it's us, you know, the ground is, is like our own intuition. I think, yeah, I think it's our bodies too, because the intuition I think is so connected with the sensory aspect of our bodies. Yeah, that's true. Intuition is a sensory it's a connection between your body and your brain. It's like this psychosensory experience. Yeah. Oh, I love it. 
I feel like this is it's so deep and it's, I could have a whole other conversation with you just about the mysteries of the world. We could get stoned or like just talk <laughs> like we're stoned and like <laughs> just have a real stoner conversation about it. <laughs> that would be interesting. I definitely want to hear that one before it went live. <laughs> yeah. I feel like anytime I start thinking about like the mysteries of the universe and like, why are we all here? What does this all mean? What is the ground beneath our feet? It's like, it gets to, I'm like, am I, am I in college and like high talking to my friends in my dorm right now? Cause that's what it feels like. I felt like that when I was kind of talking about the, all the bacteria that live in our bodies and how oh, there are yeah. more like bacterial cells and there are like Jenna or Christie cells and like oh, yes. so what does this say about the Buddhist concept of egolessness? Like who are we really? <laughs> ah. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my God. Total yeah, mind blowing. Any number of ways you can like geek out over this stuff. Totally. And it's really it yeah, it goes so deep. It's really fun to think about. Mm. And I think too, when you think about it, I mean, for me it's always I also grew up without organized religion. So I think I maybe I'm in a weird place with that. But like, for me, I'm so grateful that what my parents taught me about spirituality was basically just like, we don't know, it's all a giant mystery. And every religion has their kind of ideas about why things exist. And they're like cosmology. But we really don't know. And that's kind of cool. Like, isn't the mystery in, it, in and of itself really cool? And like, that's the attitude that I have towards these things. And so I feel like that is actually very comforting and it might not be to someone who the space for uncertainty yes totally yeah i feel like it you know it's it's maybe not so comforting if you grew up with a religion that you have to then sort of start to wrestle with or have a relationship with as an adult but to me it's like yeah it, we don't know and that's awesome part that's why intuition and connection with our bodies and connection with each other is so important because like that's how we find meaning in the world well, and I, I did grow up with organized religion. I was raised Catholic. And now that I've converted to Buddhism, I, my domestic partner is a scientist. So, you know, everybody's kind of concerned with like, no. You know? Right. <laughs> and we have these conversations all the time, like absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's interesting. Science is kind of its own, you know, worldview that functions as a religion in some cases, too, I think. Well, and it also, I mean, just the, the way that mindfulness and meditation have, have infiltrated the West, I mean, it's really melded with our culture of science. And there's so much interesting science coming out of meditation in a very secular way. So it doesn't have to be a spiritual pursuit if that is an unpleasant word for you. Right. Yeah. Plenty of, of evidence to, to show the potential benefits on lots of different aspects of our lives. Yeah, and I think a lot of the resources out there for meditation and learning meditation are secular these days. You know, a lot of the big ones, like the apps and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. Oh, well, I love talking with you. This is so much fun. I love talking with you. It can keep going. <laughs> I know, totally. Well, we'll have to do it over, over lunch sometime soon. <laughs> but meanwhile, tell us where people can find you and learn more about your book and all of your work. Well, my book is on Amazon, so they can find it there. It's paperback, Kindle, and I also recorded the audiobook. Ooh. So if you want to hear this voice um, <laughs> reading it, you can do that. Otherwise, my website is the best way to find me. It's eat to love, and two is the number two. And um, there's all kinds of like events and things like that coming out. And in fact, uh, about a week after I think this is going to come out, I have an event with Emmy. Um, the first plus size supermodel. She's basically to like body inclusivity, what John Kabat-Zinn is to the mindfulness movement. <laughs> <laughs> she was doing it when nobody else was. Um, so we're going to be appearing together at ABC Carpet in the Deepak home base on February 28th. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Congrats. That's, that's really cool. I'll see if I can make it to that too. Oh, I would love to have you there. Yes. Yes. So it'll be fun. It'll be a fun night. Sounds awesome. Well, we'll put links to all that stuff in the show notes too so people can find it and learn more about your work and also check out your previous episode. We'll link to that as well in the show notes. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jenna. It's great talking with you. Always. 
So that's our show. Thanks again so much to Jenna Hollenstein for joining us on this episode. And thanks to you for listening. If you're looking for some practical tips to help you get started on your own anti-diet path, grab my free audio guide, Seven Simple Strategies for Finding Peace and Freedom with Food. Just go to christyharrison.com slash strategies to get it. That's christyharrison.com slash strategies. To get full show notes from this episode, including all the resources we discussed, plus a full transcript, head over to christyharrison.com slash 186. That's christyharrison.com slash 186. And to get the transcript, just scroll down to the bottom of the page and enter your email address. If you've gotten something out of this podcast, please help us reach more people who need to hear the anti-diet message by sharing and subscribing. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, you can share this episode by clicking the three dots in the right-hand side of your screen and then clicking share episode. And you can subscribe by going to christyharrison.com slash subscribe. That's christyharrison.com slash subscribe. This episode was brought to you by Blinkist. These days, it can be hard to sit down and learn more. You might think you don't have time to even read a book. Well, think again. Blinkist is the only app that condenses thousands of nonfiction books into the best key takeaways, so you can read or listen to them in just 15 minutes. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash food psych to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H to start your free seven-day trial. Blinkist.com slash food psych. A big thanks to our editor and engineer, Mike Lalonde, and to my food psych programs team, including our community and content associate, Vinci Chue, our administrative assistant, Julianne Watasik, and our transcript assistant, Kiara McClellan, for helping me out with all the moving parts that go into producing this show every week. Our album art was photographed by Abby Moore Photography and designed by Meredith Noble, and our theme song was written and performed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, stay psyched. Ooh.